Okay, and thank you very much for the intro. So uh, welcome to, to our uh, session today about Kubernetes configuration. My name is Or Kamara. I'm a senior development team lead here at SNCC, and I'm happy uh, to talk with you today uh, together with uh, Scott McCarthy. Scott, you want to say hi? Oh, Scott, I think you're on mute if you want to. Oops, my apologies. I started talking without unmuting. Um, thanks, Or, and thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I, I'm a principal product manager at Red Hat for all the low-level components like uh, container engines, runtimes, and container images. Um, and so, yeah, I've been Red Hat almost 10 years and uh, looking forward to talking about security, bringing my curmudgeonly sysadmin view to the world. Amazing. So let's start. So what we're going to have today, I will start by some background and some explanation about uh, uh, like cloud security, like attack vectors in cloud security. We'll give some examples and some uh, demos for uh, those for some specific uh, vectors that might be a problem as part of your Kubernetes configuration. Then we'll see some solutions for those problems and we'll finalize with some conclusion. Uh, Scott, you want to take it over? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, would you mind going to the next slide? So, uh, actually, this is a pretty good one. You know, um, configuration vulnerabilities. We just want to highlight here, basically, that that you know, configuration is part of the security risk, and like we want to support it, showing you, know, especially at, at companies like Capital One, big banks. They they see this especially because they end up with you know up to hundreds of thousands of developers and hundreds of thousands of nodes configured and hundreds of thousands of container images and things like that. So at scale, this configuration vulnerability gets really, really pretty, uh, the risk becomes much higher. Yeah, and I wanted to, I wanted to give just a little tiny background for those that you that have maybe never heard of CIA, because I think, I think in the cloud native world, you know, there's a lot of new people to software that have kind of started cloud native and maybe don't know some of these traditional um, constructs around confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is like a very, very old school uh, model of the world that's existed for, I learned it, I don't know, 20-ish years ago. Um, but it's it's still very apropos even in this world. Um, it's just kind of the concept of like, there's a you know three main uh, types of uh, risks or attack vectors. And it, one is around confidentiality, obviously, like leaking data. So like, if you have a MySQL database in a container and the container is highly locked down, that container will still have access to like the data that it should have access to, right? And so if somebody hacks that MySQL, they could leak out the user data. Um, and so like if a container is functioning correctly and it has access to, to the type of data that it should, it could still leak that out to the world. So that's one way that people can leak out, you know, and, and basically have a security breach. Another way is around integrity, right? Like they could hamper, they could mess with a container image um, and, and sneak a misconfiguration in. They could, you know, um, even sneak in a uh, you know a configuration into your git you know in your github or something like that um and basically mess up the integrity of your cluster you know by by sneaking in a bad config file or something along those lines um and then finally availability is like the noisy neighbor problem taken to its extreme where like if somebody could for example get do a man in the middle attack and sneak a uh, bitcoin miner into one of your container images and then you end up running like thousands of those um you know, you would end up making the noisy neighbor problem within your cluster and then like take out your own, you basically create your own denial of service attack, um, you know, on yourself by pulling in images that you shouldn't have, uh, something along those lines. Um, another version of this, it's a little nastier is like in the cloud world, it'll just keep scaling up and it'll just cost you a million dollars. So it could also just be the other way around where your availability doesn't quite go down. You just end up paying a lot of money to keep the same availability. And that's kind of a new thing that didn't really exist in the traditional world. So I just wanted to kind of highlight those three, just so that the context of the rest of the things that we're going to talk about, each of each of the misconfigurations that we talk about kind of fall into these three categories. Um, and then I wanted to also highlight from a background, like these are the new primitives that you need to worry about. So like every, you know, you take a traditional IT environment and people think about things like firewalls and routers and servers. Those are the primitives that they think about. That's the traditional IT infrastructure. But when you move into Kubernetes, Every Kubernetes has these four primitives. Every Kubernetes has container images. They have container hosts. They have container registries. 
And then you have to think about all of the platform itself. So Kubernetes itself, the kubelet, um, the configuration around that, the etcd, and all the components that are part of Kubernetes. And so we wanted to highlight that, you know, configuration comes in all three of these, right? right? There are config files embedded in the container image. There are config files embedded in the host. There are config, you know, there's configuration in the registry, the way it's, again, around availability or something like that, or even data breaches. If you embed something in a registry and it's misconfigured and then it's public to the world and somebody steals it, you know, there's, there's essentially configuration embedded in all these. And then, of course, mo mostly what we'll talk about is around what's actually embedded in the Kubernetes configuration itself. But we just want to highlight that, you know, in addition to the traditional, uh, you know, IT primitives, these are the new ones that you kind of need to think about when you're thinking about Kubernetes. And so now putting it in a context where you can see, you can say it stacked up, right? Like historically, I joke, you know, the operations responsibility around the CIA and around these primitives, you know, the old IT primitives was, were mostly controlled by operations. But when you move into Kubernetes world, you know, the, the Kubernetes itself will often be ran by some kind of SRE team, which you can think of as a modern operations team. You know, the host, the trusted host, and the way that's configured and the default configuration is in there, kind of managed again by the SRE team or the operations team. But it gets a little bit hairier in the container image. That's where things get where there's really a shared responsibility over the configuration and how it works. And so that's where that's where you need to pay particular attention. And so we'll probably highlight some of that here. I want to highlight actually, I want to go a hair deeper in the next slide, um, if you wouldn't mind, or. Um, you know, th this is actually, I'm gonna hand it off to Orr, but he's gonna go deeper into like some of the things that the, the developer actually has to worry yeah. about in this container image. Thank you, so, so yeah, exactly. Let's kind of take a step back backward and try to understand what are the, what's the ownership of developers those days. Uh, so we'll start with example. So this is my uh, Python, uh, Python application. So I need to make sure that the source code, the code that I, I write by myself is secure enough. And then we will start using third party dependencies like packages that will be part of the requirements txt so we need to make sure that no security issues are part of that uh, next step for us is to wrap the uh, this application with with container right to build an image for this application so we'll write a docker file and we will use the python 3 base image as part of this base image and probably with other packages that we can install as part of the docker file there are lots of OS dependencies that we need to be aware of, right? Like security issues as part of them as well. And now we want to deploy everything to uh, to AWS, for example, and we want to use Terraform as part of those configuration, as part of the infrastructure as code files, some security uh, risks that we need to, to make sure, like in this case, to make sure that uh, uh, like our ports are not open for everyone. Um, and last but not least, our topic for today, the Kubernetes file. The configuration of the Kubernetes file uh, are definitely a major part of that. And like the, the example that we started with before is a, is a great example for our configuration file, specifically with Kubernetes, can uh, do lots of harm. Yeah, lots of things to, to make sure that, you, that we cover. Uh, and now let's start to dive into the security context of Kubernetes. So for those of you who are not familiar with, this is, uh, um, this is a security context. So security context basically let you define privilege and access control settings for your pod or for your container. So in this example, we have a, a pod configuration. As part of that, we also have the security context. Uh, and today we're gonna cover two things. Um, we we're gonna demo what what can goes wrong what can go wrong with a privileged pod, and we can also we will also demo uh, boot containers. So now let's start talking about privileged pods. So what exactly are privileged pods? So think about cases where you develop something and you need to access the host's resources. Think about accessing the network stack or accessing the GPU, for example, or just running in simple cases, like if you want, uh, if you want to run a, a Docker inside the Docker, for all of those, you actually need, need to run with a privilege mode. And the security risk is very, very simple. It means that processes and privilege pods are exactly the same as processes, as, as, as processes running on the, on the host, like root processes running on the host. And it basically means that the, an attacker can do 
anything they want if they have an access to the pod. So the solution, solution is simple as well. Don't use it if you don't need it. Um, and now let's, uh, let's see a demo. So in the next demo, we're gonna have two different applications. The first one is supposed to be a secured, secured payment application. Um, so it's kind of an isolated application. We'll see in a second why it's not really isolated, but uh, the only thing it does is just to write into a secret file named dbcards.json. Um, and in addition, we're gonna have a vulnerable application. For this application, we're gonna have two different issues. The first one is RCE, Remote Code Execution Vulnerability, uh, that is uh, just part of this application. This is not the interesting part for us. The interesting part is the, the, the second point, which is the fact that this application will run in a privileged mode. And we will see how exactly we can use the RC and the fact that this is a privileged pod in order to access the content and data from the uh, from the security uh, for in the security payment uh, secure payment application. So this is our node, and as we said, we have the uh, the privilege uh, the privilege the privilege pod, and we also have the secure payment application. Both of them uh, run on the same node. Uh, they use the same Docker engine, which also means that they use uh, the same local storage. So just imagine that our attacker managed to use the uh, the RCE vulnerability. Now they have an access to the pod, and because this is a privileged pod, they can basically access content and data from the payment application as well. And now let's see the demo. Let's just uh, look on the application first. So this is our simple application. We have a, a simple guest book. I'm gonna upload a picture into this gallery. And that's it, simple as that. And let's uh, take a look on our payment application. So this is the, the payment application. And as you can see, I'm gonna enter my credit card and donate uh, $1. And that's it, I just enter my, my credit card. Uh, let's take a look on what's going on by the scenes and, and, and Kubernetes. So let's look on the pods and we see that we have those two, uh, like two pods, one for the payment, one for the, uh, one for the regular application. Uh, so this is the regular uh, secure payment application, nothing special. And this is our, the, our like vulnerable application and we can see it's a privileged one. Now let's see what, what, what we can use as part of this application in order to act. it. So we're gonna do two simple things. The first one is we're gonna upload the shell PHP, and this is basically the remote code execution vulnerability that we'll kind of demo. Uh, we will use this PHP, we will access it from the outside using curl command, and we're gonna run some command on the on the machine. Uh, so this is our uh, this is our uh, shell script. As you can see, we can just run uh, commands as a system. So now let's just upload the shell script. And again, the shell script is just the kind of an example for an RCE. This is not the interesting part here. But I'm gonna take the name of the the PHP file and I'm gonna replace it. The first thing we're gonna do is to run a curl command that will access this file, this PHP file, uh, and then we'll be able to run simple commands on the machine. So the first thing I'm gonna do is to, just to make, make, uh, make a new directory. So I'm gonna use the make dir command. The upper terminal will show us what exactly going on inside the pod. So the upper, upper terminal is just to, so we will understand what's going on. The, the, lower, the lower one will be a, for us as an attacker. So let's look on the pod. So we see that there is nothing under the temp directory. And now we just ran the make dir command and we can see that by, uh, by, by using the PHP file, we managed to create a new dir. And now this is the interesting part. We're gonna run a mount command, which basically help us to mount the hosts file system into our pod. So we can see that there is nothing under temp, temp host 
And after we ran the mount command, we see the actual file system of the host. And this is the problem error, and we'll see in a second how we can fix it. So now just assume that I know the attacker, that the name of the secret file is a uh, cards JSON. So I'm going to just look for all the files named card JSON. And then I just want to print it. So I um, so just, just going to print the content of the file. And that's it. So again, the, this file basically located inside the other pod, but because the resources are shared between those two pods, uh, we basically managed to access from the one pod to the other because it's a because it is a privileged pod. Now let's see what we can do in order to fix that this issue. So we're just going to change the privilege to false. I'm going to rebuild all of my environment. So I have a cleanup script, and now I'm going to rebuild it again. And yeah, let's reopen the application. And now we're going to do exactly the same flow. So we're going to upload our PHP script. And we will try to do exactly the same. So now we're going to access this PHP script from the outside. Let's look on the on our pods first. Let's make sure that they are live. So yeah, they started like uh, 28 seconds ago. Now let's uh, run kubectl exec into one of them. And let's try to do exactly the same thing. So uh, we just validated that there is nothing under the temp directory. And we're going to run the make dear directory again, the make dear command again. And just a second. So now I'm going to check the content of uh, the temp file after I ran the make do command. And then, as you can see, everything is working. And now this is the difference. So now we're going to run the mount command. And because of the fact that we're not running in, in, a, privilege, in a privileged pod, the mount command fails. So let, let's try to run exactly the same command inside the pod, inside the pod so we'll understand what's the issue. And we see that we got permission denied. And again, the reason why we got permission denied is only because we used we, we didn't use privilege pod. Uh, good. So that was about privilege pods. Next topic is about uh, next demo is about root containers. So when when do we actually need root containers? Like why why is it when is it useful? So think about every simple case like that you need in order to to manage your uh, to manage your image cases like installing system packages or just edit simple configuration on the image uh, or even network operations like like simple network operations like ping for all of those you actually need uh, to run as root inside the container so the security risk is uh, pretty much is much lower than running inside a privileged pod but it's still risky because an attacker can uh, use those privileges in order to do to do some arm so we, they can access files they can explore the network um and i think that another thing to uh, to mention here is the problem that in lots of cases someone that uses uh like a simple image that was just downloaded for docker app for example they will be surprised to find out that this is also that they are running as root containers as well. So in this example, in the picture, you can see that I just used the, a PHP based image, uh, did nothing as part of the Docker file. I changed nothing related to the to the user. And when I when I will run this image, you can see that I'm still running as root. So lots of lots of images uh, come with a default uh, root uh, like default root container. Uh, so now let's see how we can solve uh, solve this problem. And we have two different solutions today. The first one is uh, Linux capabilities. Probably uh, most of you are already familiar with this uh, kind of legacy and 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 old capability. Uh, so this is kind of an option to grant very specific permissions to your application. So instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to give my application everything, I'm, we can just pick very specific permissions. So 
the basic recommendation is to follow the uh, least, privile least, least privilege uh, principle. So it means that we will, we will try to start, by, to start by dropping all of our capabilities and then gradually add those capabilities that we actually need in order to run our application. And let's try it out. So in this case, we're going to have a kind of a different environment. Uh, so this is our um, this is our uh, configuration. We see that we are not running as privileged pod, and this is our uh, our uh, container. So we will run inside the we will run a kubectl exec to run inside the inside the the pod. Let's check the IP of our machine, and now we will try to use an nmap. An Edmap, an Edmap, a tool called Nmap. Nmap is basically a free network scanner, very common among attackers. So as you can see, I just managed to scan my cluster and I found the IP of the payment service. Just imagine that there is a vulnerability on this payment service. And now because I have an access to, the, to, to this service, I can just access it and run on the payment service. Um, so yeah, in this example, we can also see that we just ran nmap command to see the open ports, the listening ports on the, the machine as well. So now let's see how we can solve the, this issue. Just imagine that I, I will just uh, uh, drop all of those capabilities. And let's, uh, let's restart our environment. So I'm going to clean up everything and rebuild again. And again, the assumption is that there is all kind of uh, the, the, there is kind of a vulnerability like an RCE as part of this application so I can get an access into it and and the problem is that because after I have an access I can do some problems so let's try to eliminate those problems as, uh, if possible so I'm going to run exactly the same flow and I'm going to run nmap again this time you will see that there is a failure and the reason for that is that is that Nmap actually requires the capability, a capability named Metro. So when we dropped all of the capabilities, we basically eliminate the option from from net, net Nmap to run. Um, amazing. So that was Linux capabilities. Let's let's continue to the next one. Uh, and the next option is run is non root. This Kubernetes option basically. Uh, let you let Kubernetes block containers that would like to run as root. So basically, you can say to containers, okay, please stop from running all the containers that would like to run as root. And the recommendation, if there is, if you know that none of your images, none of your containers need to run as root, so please just turn it on. And now let's see that as part of the example. Uh, so I'm going to remove the, uh, the drop of capabilities and I'm going to turn on the run is non root. Again, let's clean up the environment and build everything. And you can see that immediately we, we got a, an error that create container config, uh, create container config error. Let's try to understand what exactly is going on. So I'm going to run the describe command on the pod and let's look for the actual error. Yeah, here it is. You can see that we failed because the container as run is non root and the image wants to run as root. So we basically managed to block this container for, from running on our environment. Amazing. So, uh, so we talked about privilege pod, we talked about uh, uh, root containers next thing for us is to talk about resource limitation so this is kind of a kind of a, a, a different topic uh, because it's not like an immediate security risk but we will see in a second what can what can go wrong when we we don't have a proper limitation so let's first describe what kind of resources do we have so we have like cpu we have memory and and of the the basic problem is that pods run with unbounded limits, and this is by default. So a single pod can basically take all the resources, all the CPU and memory that are available on the node, and, 
And the simple case is that Kubernetes might kill the application or even nearby applications within the same node. So as you all probably know, defaults are never good. Uh, so the basic recommendation is just to, to manually assign the, the, those limitations for each and every application. So you need to make sure that you know what type and like how many resources your application uh, your applications need and then to properly set those limits. Uh, so let's talk about CPU first. Uh, so for CPU, there is a throt throttling mechanism. Uh, so, uh, so basically it means that Kubernetes doesn't really terminate those applications. So the, it, it, it will just cause uh, um, um, a, 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 like slowness on the performance. So this is like the worst case scenario. But with memory, this is a different story. So first of all, memory is not compressible, of course, and uh, pods will basically will be terminated once they will reach the memory limit. So the simple bet case is that for attacks like a DOS attack, we can block legitimate user from using our app, right? We will just take all the memory um, and that's it. No, no other users will be able to use it. So this is like the the, the simple case, but uh, the worst case is that someone will run a DOS attack on our application and it will block legitimate users from using a different application that is running on the same node. And now let's see an example for that. Uh, so in the next demo, we're going to have uh, two different applications, both of them again running on the same node. We're going to have the innocent application that uh, shouldn't be affected by any other application. Uh, but we will see in a second that it will be affected. Uh, and we also have a, a, vulnerable, a vulnerable application. Uh, at the beginning, we will see that uh, we'll run this application without any resource limitation. Um, and one important note is that we will assume that there is a vulnerability on this like vulnerable application that will basically let the, let the attacker uh, take more, more and more resources from the pod, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, so again, what we will see is that an attacker will use this kind of vulnerability. It will take more resources from the vulnerable app, but it will also affect the uh, the, the innocent application as well. Good. So. Let's look at those uh, two applications. So this is like the uh, the regular one without any resource limitation. And this is the, the innocent application, just a regular application. So for each one of those applications, we can see the amount of uh, total available memory. And this is our, our uh, vulnerable application. And as you can see, there is an API for just uh, uh, like taking more and more resources. And again, this is kind of the demo for uh, the vulnerability. So as you can see, when we uh, when we try to allocate uh, uh, one 100 megabytes, we actually affected the other innocent app. And when we tried 200 megabytes, we can see an immediate drop in the amount of avail available me uh, memory on the innocent app. So now let's try just to turn on the resource limitation. So I'm going to limit myself to um, to 100 megabyte, and I'm going to clean up all of my environment and rebuild it again. Uh, and now let's wait for the application to start. Amazing. Good. So. Let's try with a simple case. We just allocated 10 megabytes. We see that it's working, but this time we'll try to allocate more than that. And we see that immediately we failed with 100 megabyte allocation. So just this simple uh, few lines that we added prevented a potential attacker that might, uh, might use uh, a vulnerability inside our app to use it and to take more and more resources. Uh, yeah, so that was basically it, like the three demos. And now let's try to, to go over some uh, conclusions. So what did we talk about today? We talked about like the ownership 
of developers in the cloud environment. Uh, we talked about security context. Uh, about we saw an example for privilege pod. We said that it's really important for you not to use privilege pod. There are very small scenarios when you need to use it. If you don't need to use it, please don't use it. Um, uh, we also talked about boot containers. Uh, we mentioned what are the differences from privileged pods, and uh, and now we can eliminate those uh, uh, those uh, uh, security risks. And last but not least, we talked about the resource limitation. Uh, so let's talk about some uh, conclusions. So Kubernetes security is definitely hard, but is 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 also doable. And I think that as long as developers will be more and more familiar with the risks as part of Kubernetes environment, um, uh, it will be it will be just it will be just amazing. And it's we we basically need to understand that it's kind of an inseparable part of our application. It's not like we can just implement our own source codes and forget about everything. It's part of our application. We need to make sure we are familiar with those risks as well. And of course, it's all about education. So. We need to make sure that everyone are familiar with those risks. Um, Scott, you want to take it? Yeah. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, like when you look at the different primitives, you know, starting with a secure base, right? Like a, a, the wiggly pieces of your environment are, are probably where the biggest risk is. So, like, obviously, once you start sharing responsibility with the developers, making sure that you shift left, not only the configuration that you manually choose, but also the configuration that you don't necessarily realize that you're pulling in in the container images. So I always say, start with a, you know, provenance, start with the trusted thing from a trusted place. So start with a, you know, Linux base images that you, that you trust the people that put the configuration files in those base pieces, especially things around like the critical pieces, especially around like things like open SSL and glibc and things like that. And then, or I think I'm going to cover the next one. Um, <clears throat> also, like think about it in the context of configuration sprawl, right? Like it's not just it's not just like the quality of the configuration, but also the quantity. Because with quantity, you're gonna have a, a bigger risk. And so, you know, we recommend standing on like standardizing on a single base image, no matter what that is, is still a better thing than letting people pull in any base image they want. So shift left that standard uh, base image, and then make sure that standard thing is high quality. Those two things are kind of but they're both necessary, um, you know, to reach a sufficient level of, 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 you know, risk basically that you can, that you can guarantee they're not pulling in configuration from all over the place, as well as like low quality content and other things. And or I think I'll hand it back to you. Amazing. So yeah, c continuing the, the, the shifting left messages. Uh, so just try to, to understand and, uh, and like automatically catch those issues as, as soon as possible. Ideally during the, the development process. So, you know, like let's, let's issue it in production. Uh, you will have more time uh, on focusing on your own code. Um, and, and yeah, I think this is like the, the most important part. Let's try to find those issues as soon as possible. Um, so basically we, we covered only a very, very small uh, part of Kubernetes security. We skipped lots of uh, lots of uh, um, like known issues. Uh, so, if you are interested in this content, if you think that this is also an inseparable part of your application, please make sure that you uh, that you are aware about all of the security risks in um, in, in in this list as well. So, uh, make sure you're familiar with you're familiar with you're familiar with the capabilities of pod security policies uh, and how you can use it. Uh, or just the other options as part of the security context, like uh, up armor or a lot of privilege escalations. Um, I just want to demo um, uh, a, a product that we uh, launched lately, lately uh, at SNCC um, and called uh, SNCC Infrastructure as Code. So basically, SNCC Infrastructure as Code uh, let help you to find and to fix security issues as part of configurations file, configurations file of Kubernetes, Elm, Terraform. You can use it with a direct and uh, integration to your Git, or you can use it uh, with as part of the CLI. Um, and there are also some options to filter some policies and to, to change some severities as part of those policies. So if we will take a look at this example, I just scanned one of my repos. 
and I can see my file and the fact that this Kubernetes configuration actually uses a privileged pod and I get alert on that. Uh, same thing for the CLI. So I can, um, I can scan a specific file and to get an alert on that, like uh, to get the list of issues in this file. And I can also filter by severities. Of course, you can also introduce that as part of, as part of your CI CD as well. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm not sure if we have questions. Let's see. So, let me look on the, on the question a second. It looks like we have about uh, 15 questions. Let me know if you'd like me to read them off to you or you're welcome to. Uh, yeah, you wanna read them? Sure, okay. So the first one we have, um, they're asking, if possible, please provide a comparison with OKD and if there are differences there related to security. I guess I can probably grab that one or. Um, so OKD, for those of you that don't know, is the upstream project that is sort of the, uh, the we call it a midstream in Red Hat parlance and open source parlance between upstream Kubernetes and downstream OpenShift as a product. And so OKD is kind of like RDO was to OpenStack. It's kind of like Fedora is to RHEL. Um, it's this midstream, you know, but still upstream project. Um, I'd say, you know, like materially, just like Fedora and, and RHEL, you know, it's not that there's, it's not that the, we're doing experiments at OKD, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. We're updating it quickly. I'd say that's the biggest differences, right? Like from a configuration perspective, it would be really hard for me to nail down like what specific things are different. As of right now, I don't know of anything off the top of my head that's specifically different because the vast majority of the configuration probably is the same. Um, but, you know, you'd probably see some small changes here and there. And, and OpenShift as a whole was moving very quickly. And so is Kubernetes, obviously. And so you'll, you'll see, you know, call Kubernetes the fastest OKD, you know, closer to the OpenShift speed. And then OpenShift probably go, you know, has has LTS releases which go even slower, and so that kind of gives you some stability to like analyze it and things like that, and then run it, you know, in a life cycle. But but that's about the best I think I can do to that question in a short amount of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, next question: Privilege run mode is false by default. No. <laughs> uh, yes. It falls by default, but the concept is, is it, you, you need to be aware about the fact that uh, if you turn it on, there is a huge risk. Uh, so yeah. that, that's the concept. And also I'd add, or like people turn it on and then they share the files. And the next thing you know, your default happens to be on because you didn't realize it because you had 200 people sharing a config file that were all building off things. And the next thing you know, I have this providence where they've built these, you know, I, I, like any lazy sysadmin or developer, I copy things from other people that I trust. Exactly. The next thing you know, you're going to have this thing rampant in your environment. We've seen that happen uh, with OpenShift customers where we like tell them to not do things and then they turn it on and then it gets shared. And next thing you know, it's everywhere. Exactly. Um, so next question is, Yes, looks like this exploit relies on code injection via an HTTP request. Yeah, so I, I think that like the uh, the exploits are the like the less interesting part here. Like the 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 RCE that we demonstrated is all, only to for us to demo the fact that if you have a, a vulnerability on as part of your application, doesn't matter what type of vulnerability, and you can get an access to this pod if the configuration is wrong if something is wrong with, wrong with your configuration then lots of lots of uh, troubles can happen so this is the concept here not like the the actual rc yeah i agree i'd add to that too like think about that think about you know the old saying more than 50 percent of exploits come from internal users you know a malicious contractor a malicious user a disgruntled employee you know like these configuration files can have an effect on either an external exploit like the one he showed you know or showed or an internal person just deciding they're going to break out of the container that they have access to. Exactly. 
great. Um, next, please provide some more info about the differences between privileged, false, and apologize, runs, a s runs on the roof. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so I, I think that just just be aware that they're not not to confuse between like privilege and root. This is something like this is two different things. Uh, privilege means that you the the container from the container you can access the host's resources, while root containers mean that your default user, the user when that the, your container starts with, is root. Uh, but if you're running as root without any, uh, without without running as privilege root, so you, a, a privilege pod, you cannot access the host resources. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, like all of these, I'll add one more. So, so if you Google search for an article called "root inside and outside of a container," I explain this pretty well, like what it what it means. Yeah. There's, there's root inside the container, root outside the container, and like they're two separate things. And then that's separate from privileged because because privileged with root, privileged without root, like you could, there's all kinds of permutations of this that you can go. But yeah, just know that they're, like Or said, they're two different things and they have profound impacts. Great. Next we have, can you share the code used in the demo? Uh, sure. Of course we can. Um, next, it can be challenging to get good values for memory limits given their average use than spikes. Any recommendations? Uh, it, it is a challenge. Um, Scott, do you have any good answer for here? <laughs> this, this is one of my pet. This one's a tough one. I'll admit it's a really tough one. Like I joked that basically all the software that we use was written before containers. And so, you know, like JVMs and, you know, Python and Ruby and even Node.js. They were all written before containers, so there's not really this concept of limiting the memory easily, and so you end up in the OOM killer, you know, problem basically. But in a container, it's not easy to solve. I mean, you have to you have to be able to scale out your application so that it doesn't want to use up enough RAM. I mean, it's an art in, in a nutshell because you got to be able to scale out the containers so that you don't overrun the memory require, you know, for each one, and then end up with a bunch of them getting killed, you know, and things like that. I mean, it's it's an art. I'll warn you. <laughs> Yeah. But it is a really important art. So, so my recommendation is just make sure you're familiar with the application. Uh, like it's okay to play with it as long as you have monitoring, like proper monitoring. So even if you get lots of uh, out of memory, because uh, you hit the, the memory limit, if you have proper monitoring, you can play with that. And in case you hit the, the, the limit, you can just raise it a little bit. So it's like a combination between get 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 to know your application and also make sure that you have a proper monitoring. Great. Are the sample apps used for the demos something you can share? <laughs> Same. Um, we are building a repo right now at SNCC for those examples and more examples like that. And we want to open that for the community. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any if there is a specific date for us to, to make that public, but probably soon. So uh, um, I'll make sure we'll post anything about that when we'll, it will be public. Right. Any cool resources you recommend for secure and scalable systems architecture? Mm. That one's a tough one for me. Or I don't have any like architectural guides, but I do have like I work more in concepts. I try to arm people with like the concepts that are going to then let them come up with the architecture that makes sense for them because it's so hard to provide what they need because there's still so much. But I can share a couple articles in, in the chat to like respond with things that I think give good guidelines that will help you come up with your own architecture. Or yeah. maybe we can share them afterwards. That sounds good. And, and I, I guess it's also, it's hard to, to learn that because it's very different between environment, right? Uh, so one thing like one architecture that is really suitable for one company is maybe not not so proper for another one. Just imagine the fact, uh, just imagine the, the case of the privileged pod. So maybe you actually need to run privileged pods because you need to access the GPU. It is it is possible. So it doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't use the privileged pod, but you need to think about the proper architecture to prevent security issues like that. Um, yep, I agree. And then you just, 
it's still so, so if you Google search for uh, container defense in depth, I have a talk around this where I talk about, you know, there's process level isolation all the way to data center isolation. You have to have them in different resource zones in Amazon. And like or said, like if you have to provide privilege for like, say you have GPUs, then you just need a different level of isolation. Maybe you need a separate Kubernetes cluster where you allow that privilege stuff to happen for those GPUs and you have a different one. That, that is for your applications that are external facing. And this, this is really no different than what we've always had, right? Like if you look SAP and Oracle at a traditional environment ran on an internal network and then your web and DNS ran in a DMZ facing the internet, right? And you, you separated those from a network storage and data set, you know, essentially rack level isolation. It's not really any different with cloud. You just have different use cases. So it's not bad that necessarily you need privileged here and there. It's just, if you're gonna need it, know that that whole cluster basically is now dedicated to that that use case yeah that's why i say i try to talk in concepts so that people can come up with their own their own architectures that make sense yeah. um next what about distroless images and root access for container uh, i can go yeah, after go this if you want or yeah so like did, I, the first thing i'll say is i don't think those things really have anything to do with each other it's equal Risk so distro. Just think of distro as doesn't have RPM or apt in the container. Like it, it is not connected to a, a dependency tree where it pulls in more packages. You know, um, you know, we're building root. We're for example, we're building distro images for Rel eight four for UBI, and all that means is we're making them smaller and not having a root. You know, not having RPM and well, not having RPM and yum in it basically is all it means. And so you're still relying on a distro somewhere behind the scenes. You might not understand it or see it locally in the container image, but it still exists out there because somebody's building CVEs and rebuilding that software and tracking all that stuff. There's there's no such thing as distro list. There is only somebody else's distro that you borrow and then use, and that could be somebody else compiling it. But but that is really, really very independent from whether it's root access in the container or if you're running dash dash privileged, you know, for example. Again, those are those are very, very distinct you know, problems. You could have a privileged distro list container that hacks you just as easily. Like it's not gonna stop somebody from curling something into the container into memory and then executing it. Like like even if you make the container read only in distro list, that's not gonna stop or mitigate root access or privilege. Like because they'll just copy it into RAM and run it and, and they you always have access to RAM. So like even if you don't have access to disk with read only. That's my best shot at that. <laughs> Great. Um, next is, isn't pod security policies being deprecated? Um, so, so we haven't actually touched the pod security policies. We talked about pod security context, uh, just as a concept for to understand like what privileged pods uh, are. So for those of you who are not familiar, like pod security policy is a cluster level resource and controls. Um, so, um, uh, it's not. The, I'm not aware that it's being deprecated. Like Scott, anything from your I'm, side? Like? I'm not aware of it either. On that, on that one, I'm a little less less up to date. Yeah. Yeah. But again, like the the, the concept of privilege pod is not deprecated, right? It's, it's still there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, same same thing from the like the all the the risk that we demonstrated. Yeah, we've even been talking. There was a little chat in the Kubernetes community maybe three, four weeks ago, right, right around the turn of the year. I don't remember exactly when, but I remember there's some there's some Google guys and some Red Hat guys. I was involved in it. There was a bunch of people. We were talking about how do we get people to run as non-root in the container? Like it's really, really hard because Docker had the concept of letting people to run, run anything as root. And you know, internally at Google, I don't think things run as root in Borg, but in Kubernetes, it's really common for people to run as root. There, there's 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 movements, if you will, afoot to try to educate the world on how to not do this, but we're kind of down the rat hole because the way the image format works, we just kind of all adopted root. So like, that's the best I can kind of give you on that. There's definitely a movement afoot. Every all the smart intelligentsia knows we shouldn't be running things as root, but yet we still are. Right, great. We still have about ten questions left and about ten minutes left in the webinar. Um, this next question. Uh, has about three questions in it, so bear with me. Um, it's a long one. It's a long one. <laughs> um, does shifting security responsibility to the left potentially have greater implications for a supply chain attack? How should final approval of a K containerized service product be handled to avoid such attacks? Do stakeholders with higher authority need to be aware and have understanding of potential risk when reviewing final configurations? 
I feel like somebody like set this question up for me or I don't know if you. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Enjoy. All right. Yeah, that, this is one I've talked about for many years. I, I've talked about it with with, uh, you know, it, po, po, all kinds of talks and panels and all kinds of crap. But um, yeah, in a nutshell, yes, when you shift left, obviously, when you share, this is just a basic, you know, engineering thing, like more moving parts always equals higher risk, right? Like if you can, if you can push 100 pounds with a single gear, or you need to push 100 pounds with 22 gears, it's more likely to fail with 22 gears, right? And so as you as you add developers, you absolutely increase the risk to not only the container images and all the configuration that are in those, which yes, I, I think supply chain attack in the image is probably the, the biggest scare for me. And then there's also the supply chain attack in the configuration files, like like or and I mentioned, like if somebody turns on root, you know, in a Kubernetes YAML file, that thing gets committed to GitHub and everything everybody starts forking it and using it. And next thing you know, you have root, you know, privileged equal true or you know, like like that's that's a problem. Um I would say it starts with provenance first. Start with trust, right? Like maybe always go back to a golden template for the Kubernetes YAML file that is approved by security and say, everybody should develop off of this. And anytime you change one of these default configurations, we should know why you did that. You know, like, like when you commit it in Git, somebody needs to explain why they did that. You know, like that's a good way to do it. It's like trust, but verify, right? Like, and then, and then you could scan it later with some lint or something that maybe has all the rules in it to see who's changed or whatnot. But, but I think people rely too much on the scanning thing. They're like, ah, if we just scan it, it'll be fine. You can never scan your way out of bad security. Like, like the, the known things that you'll have in your tests is always less than the, the reality of the universe. And there'll always be things you didn't catch and they'll always be out of sync. So like, so like, it's like CI CD testing. Like it gives you a bit of a warm and fuzzy, but we all know just because it passes CI CD doesn't mean it's secure. doesn't mean it performs right. doesn't mean that it's, you know, like actually even doing the right thing it's supposed to do. It just means that it passes all the things that we tested for. Like, and so it gives you a level of confidence, but it's not there. You got to start with a secure base image, a secure configuration, and then work forward from there and then scan to maybe verify that you didn't drift too far from those things. That's my rant on that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my, my answer is much, much shorter. Like I, I'll answer only to the last one. So yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, stakeholder must understand what's going on. Uh, you can just introduce new changes to your environment without understanding what's going on. Uh, yeah, the cases that Scott just mentioned, like just downloading comp configuration file, who knows who, what someone put there. Uh, just think about a simple installation of a Elm template. So do you really understand what's going on? Do you really read each and every line out of it? Uh, so the answer should be, you need to be aware of, that, of it for sure. Uh, and yeah, try to use more tools. Uh, to, 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 to help you as part of this process. But uh, yeah, the answer is definitely yes. Great. Um, is it enough if we only set up the privilege pod, pods to false for pod security? Um, so, so again, it, the, for privilege pods, it depends on the scenario. If you don't need it yet, it's enough. Um, but in cases where we actually need the privilege pod, I guess you will need to think about other workarounds to make sure that nothing else is accessible in this, in this cluster. Uh, but yeah, the, there is a risk that in that. Yeah. I might, I might add like removing privilege is a good first step. The next thing I would do is not run as root, like, like, like run it as a regular user. Like if you're going to run a web server make sure it runs as the HTTP user or whatever, like make sure those things drop privs and don't need, you know, also look at the capabilities, you know, if you like the one example or you gave, which is really good, drop all privs, drop all capabilities and then turn on just a few until your app works. Like, like start yes. with nothing and then work your way backwards. I think, I think capabilities is a good place. I think set comp is a good place. I think SE Linux and the S for the way like, OpenShift does it is we automatically dynamically generate an effort, a, a label for SE Linux, and then all the different containers can't talk to each other, or see each other just by default. Um, and I think not privileged, you know, you definitely don't. And then not run is not root. Like those are probably the ones that I off the top of my head yeah. all think about. Uh, yeah, but by the way, I think it's a really nice exercise just to to make sure that you understand what's going on inside of your application. So. Next time you, you, you want just to drop all of the capabilities and just to understand gradually what's going on. Okay, we need a, like network access. We need 
some access to the disk or something like that, but it's, it's really useful just to understand what's going on. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge recommendation. All right, we have just about four more questions and just a few minutes left. So let's see, does a, a sneak container gather, scan gather data from the images it scans? So we haven't talked about sneak container scan. Uh, we just talked about the sneak infrastructure scope uh, scan. Uh, so for the sneak container scan, just understand what dependencies are part of your uh, Docker image. Um, and we check what uh, security issues are, are part of those uh, part of this list. And that's it. We don't, we don't gather any information like content files, stuff like that. All right. Which Linux WMDE was used in the demos? Uh, I3. Okay. How, to valid, how to validate Kubernetes YAML? Uh, <laughs> That's a tough one to answer because, like, you have to have some expertise and know what you're looking at. But, like, or made some good examples. But I'm not aware of any tools that simplify it or kind of do it for you. Off the top of my head, I'm not aware of anything, but I'm sure stuff exists. Yeah. All right. And last question um, Setting a memory limited model, the application to scale out with multiple replicas instead of using more memory per pod, is that a proper approach? Yeah, that's what I was hinting at when I said you got to do a balancing act between scaling out. So like if you know what the load on a particular, I'll, I'll just go one little deeper or if you don't mind, uh, yeah. like if you know what load generates 100 megabytes of, you know, memory usage, you can then kind of scale out horizontally and only load up each web server, each database server, whatever that they use up a certain amount of memory. That's part of the art of all of this. I do this in one of the labs I, I run where I show you can scale something out. It actually doesn't perform any better. Um, it actually performs worse sometimes when you scale out. There is a PID loop there where you go too far and it doesn't perform well and you scale it in and it actually performs a little bit better. And it, it's an art. It, it's something that you got. Load testing and is always an art. You got to always load test things and then see how it works. Yeah. But by the way, we, di we didn't cover that at all as part of this, uh, this uh, lecture. Like we just talked about the security risk that might be part of it. So yeah, it's definitely a, 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 an expertise that someone needs to learn for sure. Um, I think this one is an answer to the previous question, right? Yes. Yeah, they're just showing um, cubeyaml.com. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, I think that's it. I just want to thank Laura and Scott so much for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you are able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks all.